Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, the podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Tristan Haggard, along with his wife, Jessica, run Primal Edge Health, the popular brand, blog, and YouTube channel focused on changing lives through animal-based nutrition. After trying veganism and watching their health suffer, Tristan and his wife became dedicated to helping others using ketogenic and carnivore lifestyles. They've since published multiple awesome cookbooks, shared tons of information, recipes, and research on social media, created great podcasts, and they host a monthly keto and carnivore collective. Most recently, Jessica created the Carnivore Cookbook, Zero Carb Recipes for People Who Really Love Animals, which I got a copy of and absolutely love. Welcome to the show, Tristan. Man, that that's the most awesome introduction. I'm gonna have to pull that and put that before all of my live streams. <laughs> that's great, man. You're welcome too. Yeah, no, it's all true. Right, and flattered. I feel like you were uh, keto before keto was cool, YouTube before YouTube was cool. So I've been following you for a long time. Thanks, man. Well, keto is keto and YouTube are cool now. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> what is going on here? Something's that's what wrong. they tell me. Um, <laughs> Ban and ship. Um, well, for folks who don't know, Tristan, um, I'd love you to start with just a little bit of background on you and how you got turned away from veganism um, in the first place. Cool. Yeah, it's funny because this is something I never really spoke about on the channel up until about the last couple of years when it became abundantly clear that there was a huge turning tide um, after this massive surge of uh, popularity of the vegan diet on YouTube, there was a huge shift in people moving away from it for various reasons. And I completely sympathize with a lot of people, a lot of the popular vegan YouTubers that I see leaving the vegan diet or even the vegan ethical movement, which is a much bigger and more important issue, in my opinion, than just the dietary aspects of it. So anyways, we got involved in looking at diet as a way to improve health uh, back in like 2000. 9, 2010, Jessica and I, I think it was maybe beginning of 2009 when we actually got serious about using a dietary approach to managing things like chronic pain and inflammation. So I grew up with asthma, allergies, taking antibiotics. Um, I remember my, brody, my brother had kidney stones when he was a young kid. I was just thinking about that earlier. I never had kidney stones, luckily, but all the symptoms that we see these days and that a lot of the people in the carnivore and low-carb community are familiar with that are associated with, first of all, high junk food intake, second of all, rampant antibiotic use and gut microbiota dysbiosis, um, and I, I started looking at possibly using food as a way to decrease my inflammation and get through my day-to-day -day life. Um, I was experiencing a lot of pain, inflammation from an injury that I had skateboarding. Um, so I, I got hurt skating, had a massive knot in my hip that affected my back. It affected my spine. Uh, but this wasn't the start of it, right? There's no, I can't pinpoint any one moment when I realized, wow, my body's not functioning as well as it could. It's just something that I always was aware of as a kid, right? And I was never a star athlete or anything, but when I played baseball and soccer, I would always feel certain limitations, uh, felt, felt a little bit disconnected in movement patterns and stuff sometimes. Uh, yeah, I was still proficient, never a, a high level athlete or anything, but you know, I, uh, I was a mediocre at best, right? And I started realizing when I was about 20 years old that something was seriously wrong with the inflammatory response in my body. This was after a serious injury skating, like I mentioned a moment ago. And I met somebody who started introducing me to the idea of using nutrition as medicine. So a friend of mine started uh, telling me about how he's making smoothies and how he's doing mostly plant-based approach. 
uh, brought me to a vegan restaurant and we had this uh, vegan Indian food that was pretty decent, a little spicy and flavorful and uh, colorful and all that. But looking back, you know, most of these foods are um, not something that I would focus a diet on anymore. So started reading about a vegan diet, learning a little bit about the uh, the ins and outs of a vegan diet. At the time, there were a lot of people who were warning against it, just like there are today. And of course, I listened to many of the people who were saying this is not the best approach. This is something that may uh, be undertaken with extreme caution, but perhaps isn't good for everybody or maybe isn't even good for anybody. So I was listening to a lot of different opinions on it. And I tried various ways of doing a vegan diet. I started out eating like a whole foods vegan diet, trying to focus on whole grains, legumes, stuff like that. I cut out wheat and would eat things like quinoa. Um, well, we, we used to eat like millets and all these other really just ridiculous foods that I would never spend money on anymore. Um, and so we were, we use coconut oil and, and make uh, yams and stuff like that and have beans and rice. And sometimes we would do a little bit of cheese, but we think, oh, we don't really need it. Maybe we should go without the cheese altogether. We experimented. We did kind of an in and out of veganism thing for about two years, never ethically sold on the idea. Most of the vegans that I met at the time were uh, just socially people that I, I wasn't so interested in. And uh, long story short, it didn't work out, right? right? You see it all over vegan YouTube, uh, gut issues, inflammation, not improving, but in fact, uh, seeming to get exacerbated with time, started trying things like fasting even, or just, you know, having, uh, you know, doing mono meals where I would fast, maybe do a few days on just coconut water and water. I, I, I tried many different ways of going about it and ended up just, thinking this is ridiculous. Why am I wasting my time with this anymore? So every time I would start to restrict meat for longer than a few weeks, I would crave it. I'd start feeling like shit. And I would basically go back to eating animal foods and realize the importance of animal foods through trying to restrict them. Uh, basically banging my head up against the wall, thinking all these people, all these so-called experts are saying that this is possible. They're saying that this is doable. These people claim they're thriving with it. And I just didn't feel it. So I went back to animal foods. Before our daughter was born, we uh, I think it was maybe six, eight months before, um, oh, maybe it was three or four months before conception, right? We just stopped playing with vegan diet altogether. My wife's next to me. I was, I was anemic when I was pregnant. She had a little bit of anemia when she was pregnant. We oh, weren't gosh. vegan going into pregnancy, but like just, you know, I mean, she, women, anemia in women is very pop, is uh, rampant these days. It's not popular at all, like I was going to say, <laughs> but. Um, so she experienced certain nutrient deficiencies leading up to the pregnancy. Uh, she was low in iron. Um, she I felt anemic. Yeah, she did. Yeah, exactly. We, we hadn't spent very much time making animal foods for a few years. And during the pregnancy, we started eating more animal foods, realized the importance of that. Our daughter was born in 2012, the end of 2012. Um, we ended our vegan experimentation at the beginning of 2011. And she, our daughter was born in May 2012. And about nine months, 10 months in, uh, after she was born, we started noticing that she was getting dental caries. Her teeth were kind of just turning to powder, her front teeth. And this sent us on this mad journey to try to figure out what is going on. Is there something nutritionally that we're missing that could be affecting our daughter's health and our daughter's teeth? Uh, we came upon the Weston A. Price Foundation's information. We came upon Sally Fallon's work. We read Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price and realized that perhaps the period of time leading up to the pregnancy was uh, was influential in the uh, the dental health that our daughter experienced early on. Now, we started implementing for her lots of butter, lots of broth, uh, cod livers, uh, liver, eating nose to tail, foods like bone marrow. And that led us to understand the importance of fat as a dietary um, component for fat soluble vitamins, for nutrients that you're not going to get from plants, but also as a possible fuel. Now, we didn't give our daughter a ketogenic diet, but our daughter just loved the fat. So we found ourselves eating lots of fat, lots of animal food, and I would eat some plantains. I would have some sweet potatoes, basically a paleo diet. Uh, back in 2000, end of 2012, early 2013. Then we started looking at 
the ketogenic diet. We started hearing that, well, fat is a very efficient fuel and you're already eating a very high fat diet. And when you pull out the carbohydrates, there's even more magic that can happen. So I started looking at the science of ketosis. Um, and from looking at guys like Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, he was one of the first early advocates on the internet back then. And uh, looking at some of his lectures and learning about a ketogenic diet made me want to try it, tried out keto, loved it, felt fantastic. And that eventually led me to the carnivore diet, led me to looking at perhaps a zero carb approach has some interesting effects that would go beyond what you'd be getting just off of a ketogenic diet. Because when I first started keto, what I thought was, well, okay, low carb feels really good. How could there be any more benefits to no carb? You're basically, you're pulling out the spinach, the broccoli, you're pulling out these leafy greens that all these keto advocates and a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the literature talks about the importance of these leafy greens. I mean, people are obsessed with leafy greens for health. We've been told that they're the greatest thing ever, that they're just amazing for our health and for longevity and that they have antioxidants and they have right, uh, right. minerals and vitamins, right? But then I started looking into the anti-nutrient content of a lot of these foods which was touched on in Weston Price's book. Uh, they talk about the uh, the necessity of preparing grains and plant foods in a specific way to make them bioavailable, digestible. But I don't know. I just I wasn't sold on the idea of trying a zero carb diet. I thought, well, all right, this is this sounds kind of extreme, right? Like I I did a vegan diet where I ate no animal foods at all, and I hated that. And I felt like crap. Why the heck would I take out all the plants? I love me some avocados. Like I like the plants; they're fine. No need to try this. Yeah. Um, Eventually, when I did try it, I found that it was uh, definitely something that <laughs> that is well worth looking into, especially if you've been on long-term ketogenic diet, if you've done long-term paleo diet, and if you've done a long-term vegan diet, which I never did a long-term vegan diet. All the short spurts I did on a vegan diet within the two years of experimentation would be quickly broken up with some animal foods, at which point I would feel my brain, my physiology, and my body just light up again. Um, and so, yeah, look at the, uh, at the carnivore information, started learning a little bit more about these anti-nutrients. And then of course, talking to guys like Sean Baker, giving me the confidence to actually try it myself and slowly made a transition to a more carnivorous diet for the last couple years. It's been pretty much all animal foods and yeah, I guess that's the, the long rambling, uh, Genesis story of, uh, kind of my, my YouTube channel and where we're at now. Yeah, I love it. That's really helpful, Tristan, and great to hear about your journey and your wife's journey. And, and the theme I hear across it all is just relentless information seeking and trying to get better yourselves um, while sharing it with others, which is awesome. Um, yeah, so what am I missing? You know, I'm always wondering, what am I missing? Yeah. And what's crazy is that's led me to eat a diet that's basically missing all plants. And, uh, <laughs> And I don't miss them. That's the, the wild thing about yeah. it. I don't miss them. Oh. <laughs> and uh, shifting a little bit, um, one thing I, I love hearing you talk about and I feel like you have such a good grasp on is what concerns you the most about kind of how our world is changing and society, not society, but certain um, certain stakeholders, let's call them, are threatening our food supply in some ways and threatening to affect the access to food we have. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is a pretty, this is a very deep issue. And this is something that goes far beyond what, uh, what most people might consider when they think about food, right? People think of food as entertainment. People think of food as nourishment. Hopefully they think of food as nourishment. Many of us think of it as entertainment. We eat Cheerios and Frosted Flakes. You got Tony the freaking tiger in the box of, uh, of cereal yelling at you slogans and, uh, even cute animals floating around on the commercials telling you to eat the grains, eat your heart healthy. <laughs> whole grains with sugar in a box from General Mills. And you know, we we don't think about the broader cultural uh, and social engineering aspects of food. So food is fuel. Right? Everybody knows about, you know, everybody talks about uh, gasoline and oil, you know, these commodities as, you know, big players in geopolitics, right? Everybody, most people are willing to admit that the United States has gone to war over oil many times and that the history of the 20th century, the wars of the 20th century, many of them, all of them are about resource consolidation. So I was just always fascinated with history, fascinated with the driving forces behind history and wanted to understand 
I mean, events like World War II, World War One, Vietnam, you know, the 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 the, the baby boomers, you know, the, all these interesting little fac, uh, facets of history. You know, what is causing and what is driving this uh, this ship? And it was always something that fascinated me. So, uh, studied history since I was a little kid. Studied history in the university, and I think one of the most fascinating aspects of the food uh, supply now are the connections of these massive corporations, the NGOs, um, and the big investors behind our foods have certain ideologies that all link up, right? So there's this overarching theme of the belief that the world is overpopulated, that there's limited resources, that humans are bad. Um, you know, you've got the whole climate cult, which I call it, uh, very pervasive these days. Uh, we've been raised since we were children to think that babies are bad, that humans are destroying the planet. You know, BBC is constantly pumping out documentaries with Richard Attenborough. And Richard Attenborough always <laughs> talks about how human beings are the most destructive force on the planet. And we've been given this essentially this ideology that tells us that we're bad, that tells us that there are too many of us. Right. And there is, if you look at history, there is a major connection between the you know, big money oligarchs, whatever you want to call it, you know, the people behind the big foundation. Everybody knows about the Rockefeller Foundation, um, the uh, the Carnegie Endowment, the Ford Foundation. A lot of these generational wealth families were heavily involved in the eugenics movement mm -hmm. and eugenics being the idea that you can control society that you can control the human organism and the development and the evolution of humanity through selective breeding so essentially looking at human beings like uh like dogs to be bred right like you might bred a certain dog for characteristics like fighting you know pit bulls were bred to take down bulls cocker spaniels are bred to get little rats and find small rodents um there's this threat of the elite that essentially look at human beings like this. They look at food as one of the major tools for socially engineering, physically engineering, and ultimately genetically engineering the human organism and society as as a whole. So that's one of the uh, – what I think is one of the biggest issues that we face today is the extension of this ideology into the modern world. People think that the eugenics movement died in World War II. Right. So the Nazis are very famous for having engaged in eugenics practices. But what people don't know is uh, and this recently came out in the news. Japan was also highly engaged in eugenics practice practices and forcibly sterilized large portions of their population. Uh, the United States was also involved in the very same programs around the very same time in selective breeding, the attempt to weed out undesirable portions of the population in order that only the fittest would breed. And who are the fittest? Well, you know they're the fittest because they breed. So it's kind of this psychopathic mentality where you know these people believe that it's survival of the fittest, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And that leads a lot of people, it logically leads to the conclusion that, well, if you are the last one surviving and everybody else is sterile and dead, then you are the fittest. So it's essentially, it's a psychopathic philosophy and psychology a uh, psychological profile, uh, rather, that gets kind of holographically imprinted on us through media, through education, through television. And people are just swimming in this ideology and have no idea that it is so self-destructive. It's even self-refuting at the most basic level. And uh, this is one of the most powerful driving forces behind a lot of the ills we see in the world today is the philosophy, the presuppositions about our space, our place in the world and in reality that we believe and that we've been programmed to believe by the very forces that are feeding us these crap foods um, and you know, essentially degrading our, um, our life potential, our ability to be healthy and happy and destroying our connection to the food chain. So since World War II, especially, we've seen a massive industrialization of the food supply and we've seen processed foods replace our whole animal foods and with that has come diabetes obesity skyrocketing cancer rates and of course there are other factors involved as well that are environmental such as you know electromagnetic pollution uh radio frequency waves uh the non-native electromagnetic frequencies these things all play a part as well 
Also, you know, the chemical and fertilizer contamination that we see rampantly in the first world and the third world. I mean, the soil degradation. These are all connected intimately to the food supply, which has been monopoly, uh, monopolized to a great extent already by these same foundations, these same big moneyed interests behind things like the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, which was Germany's eugenics scientific dictatorship eugenics program, which sought to uh, make sure that only the fittest would breed, only the desirable races and people would breed. These same foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation that started the Green Revolution to spread high yield patented seeds, uh, to spread the industrialized agriculture system, to spread the factory farming system. These are the same foundations that funded the eugenics movement. So they essentially pivoted their uh, their stance, and instead of openly advocating for selective breeding, for sterilization of the weak and uh, invalids, they used to call them, and prisoners, which happened in the United States as well. And uh, the, these uh, same foundations have moved on and now are pushing what we see as the climate change cult, the uh, the green agenda, which is basically greenwashing massive corporate interests consolidating the food supply. So you see companies like Nestle, General Mills, uh, Cargill, Syngenta, Dow, uh, Bayer Pharmaceutical. These are the big names that are involved in the pushing of this plant-based food dietary guideline thing that we saw with the Eat Lancet Foundation, the Eat Lancet Commission, rather. Uh, so you see billionaires like the Stordalin Foundation, which was started, which was given to this woman by her husband, who was a uh, pharmaceutical, I believe, pharmaceutical uh, fortune uh, heir. So you see a lot of these, you know, this generational wealth transferring from from big pharma, big agriculture, big oil. Rockefeller Foundation uh, being the biggest in the United States. Maurice Strong is the guy in Canada who helped set up the uh, the Agenda 21, Agenda for the 21st Century, and Agenda 2030, which were uh, signed on at the Rio Summit in 1992, where all the nations of the world, not all the nations, but many of the nations of the world agreed to try to reduce the effects of man-made global warming and climate change through policy, right? Through policy of dietary policy, through policy of where people can live, what they're allowed to do, where they can move. And it's essentially a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? It gets sold to us as progress. It gets sold to us as enlightenment. It gets sold to us as we're saving the planet. But in reality, the money behind it is all coming from the Fortune 100, big corporations, uh, big banks, big investment, and uh, these tax-free foundations that play a shell game throughout the entire world, starting revolutions through things like the Open Society Foundation, uh, starting agriculture revolutions through things like the Rockefeller Foundations, and even funding – uh, other intersectional movements and social justice like feminism and stuff like that, there is an intersectionality here of not only the people on the ground who Stalin would have called the useful idiots of the revolution, but at the higher levels as well where we see like the Ford Foundation creating this new building in New York called the Ford Foundation Center for Social Justice. Um, and these things all sound really great. They sound really fluffy. They sound really um, good and they sound like they're really – uh, going to try to do good for the world. So you know, Bill Gates says he wants to save the planet. He wants to stop climate change. And how is he going to do this? Well, as the biggest investor, or one of the biggest investors in Monsanto, uh, and one of the biggest shareholders in Monsanto, he's going to spread GMO seeds all over Africa and give them Roundup. Right? <laughs> he's not going to go put. He's not going to go put wells in Africa. Bill Gates goes and spreads Roundup and glyphosate drenched uh, seeds that the farmers have to buy every year. So I, that's a broad picture that I painted right there, but that's essentially um, part of the information that I like to touch on is the bigger geopolitical aspects of this that goes beyond just diet. This has to do with ultimately the control of resources and the attempted control over human breeding itself. And it might sound crazy to a lot of people out there, but um, you know there are many books written by these very people who promote this stuff, by the people behind it. These people openly publish books, memoirs, and uh, essays and articles about this stuff all the time, and they openly admit uh, their intention to control resources and develop the planet 
sustainably, right? They use these keywords that are easy to sell the public with. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot there to, uh, to pick apart, but that's the basic outline. Yeah. It's super interesting. And Tristan, I love how you apply both kind of a historical, political and economic frameworks to this, um, because I think they're all relevant. And at the end of the day, it, a lot of it, it just comes down to uh, financial interests and it's it's a business at the end of the day. And, um, you know, I, I love how you started with Kellogg and, and just getting people to eat more cereal requires political lobbying. It requires control of the agricultural system. Um, it requires influence into the types of health authorities we trust with uh, knowledge around what we should eat and and how we should prescribe uh, drugs. So it, it's, it's a really interesting topic. And if folks are curious to dig more into this, I'd really encourage them to go check out some of the content on your channel, check out some of your interviews. You have a lot of great um, YouTubes and podcasts about this. Um, great, great. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Kellogg. Just uh, throwing this one little factoid out there. Kellogg was actually, he founded something called the Race Betterment Foundation, and he was heavily involved in the eugenics movement as well. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so all these people, there was, <laughs> Rockefeller used to go to Kellogg's sanitarium. So did Ford. Uh, and you, you know, so there's a lot of intersectionality here between these big foundations, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Race Betterment Foundation. So that sounds, you know, that would be completely P, uh, un-PC today. Yet these are the people, you know, the Fortune 100 companies that are now talking about social justice and pushing this stuff. Uh, the very people who were just a few decades ago promoting selective breeding and the, uh, the forced sterilization of other races and undesirables. So these are just really kind of sick people. Yeah. Yeah. It's really scary stuff. Um, and shifting back to uh, brighter topics, um, I've really enjoyed some of your recent conversations. Um, you've had some great live streams on your YouTube channel uh, with folks like Amber O'Hearn and Josh Blackburn and Michaela Peterson. Um, and I'm curious, as it pertains to carnivore, um, you've been doing this for a while now and before, you know, mostly animal based keto. But have any of your recent conversations with them changed your mind at all about um, how you eat a carnivore diet and how you think about things like protein and fat. I think it's cool. Every time I talk to, to one of these uh, other voracious readers and researchers, you know, Amber O'Hearn, she just has such a incredible wealth of knowledge available on her website. And she puts out so much content that is consistently intriguing. And it's consistently looking at things from a different angle. I'm just, I'm constantly learning. So I really like Amber O'Hearn's explanation of why perhaps the word nutrient density can be a little bit misleading. Uh, I, I, you know, I've kind of looked at the word nutrient density a little bit differently from talking to Amber O'Hearn because it's a word I've been throwing out for like the last six years on my YouTube channel talking about the nutrient density of organs and whatnot. And what I've come to learn from a lot of these people is, well, maybe eating nose to tail while as it's something that's makes it affordable depending where you live, right? If you live near ranchers or you can get locally raised meat, eating nose to tail is pretty easy and allows you to get a lot of fat in, get really nutrient dense pieces like the, uh, you know, liver and heart. It can be great, but some carnivores are doing great without including that at all. So yeah, always have to, uh, to be open to, you know, changing my mind on things and talking to a lot of these people who've done nothing but rib highs for years and years and, some of them even get negative reactions when they eat liver. Some people even get negative reactions when they're including these other foods. So I just, I respect all these different approaches to a carnivorous diet. And talking to so many people over the years has allowed me to add a lot of tools into my toolbox. You know, we work with a lot of clients who do group coaching and really, uh, really enjoy coaching people. It's something that I've always loved is basically you know, relaying information to people, helping people troubleshoot, getting to know people's own individual contacts and help them to refine and be another pair of eyes on the situation there. So these experts like Amber, uh, guys like Josh have really helped me to get a different perspective on all these other case studies that I get to see constantly. So Josh, for instance, doing a carnivore diet that was much higher in protein, wasn't as fatty. And then moving towards a more keto carnivore diet was something that I love hearing because I see a lot of people in long-term carnivore diets go the same route. 
right? They go from eating maybe three to four pounds of meat a day to eating one pound of meat a day, but increasing the fat dramatically. And they realize that it works very well for them. Uh, and of course, guys like Sean Baker, they're just pounding steaks and not really being so concerned with increasing the fat. But that Sean Baker does like the grain finished steaks, which seem to have more fat on them. So right. I think all of these give us different perspective on what works and what the situational awareness that somebody using a uh, carnivorous or ketogenic carnivorous diet should be, uh, you know, attempting to have. So I'm all about the situational awareness when I'm working with clients and looking at people's diet and lifestyle and, you know, the application for depression with Michaela and with Amber O'Hearn are just incredible. And it's something that I wasn't, you know, I never really dealt with crazy intense depression to the level that they did, but it's something that I definitely relate with as, you know, anxiety, general sense of well-being, being improved with a carnivore diet. And then Josh Blackburn, who's just one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. Um, you know, so yeah. shout out to Josh Blackburn. And he dealt with you know, crippling depression, you know, suicidal ideations, bipolar, terrible digestion. And he was, you know, he, he said, he looks, it's not perfect, but my life is so much better now. And he feels like he's come out of a fog. So I think it's really important that we look at these different situations and look at how we can apply this type of diet and the different manifestations that it might have. Somebody might, you know, I get a lot of clients that come to me and they're not ready to do or willing to do the diet like I do it. So it's not about what works for me and projecting that on every single other person and saying, this is how you have to do it. Some people might feel better on a keto diet that includes some plants just because of the sheer psychology of it. They haven't wrapped their head around the anti-nutrient issue. They haven't come to terms with the fact that we can live and thrive off of strictly animal foods. And uh, so in, in certain cases, it might be better to include some carbohydrates even, right? So high-level athletes, somebody who's trying to gain some weight, um, including some animal-based carbohydrates can be great. So if I'm trying to gain weight, I'll eat or drink rather whole raw milk. Uh, so there's there's just so many different contexts that I'm appreciative of this community for bringing to light. And podcasts like yours are always highlighting the different opinions out there, the different ways of doing it. And I think that's why you know guys like you and I are so blessed to be in this position because we get to pick the brains of the coolest, most kind and intelligent people that uh, we can find in these communities. And we get to select and talk to these awesome people and learn from them and help share their message as well. So I'm, I'm really all about you know helping other people share their message, helping people get the uh, the word out there and reach as many people as possible and teach people how to do it the right way in their context. That doesn't mean it's got to look like me. It doesn't mean they have to uh, you know move to Ecuador, grow a big beard, go bald. <laughs> uh, and you know it's, you, you don't have to do everything just like me. It's just what works in your situation, what you can enjoy and maintain and sustain long term. That's what I'm all about. Yeah, I love that. Um, and that's awesome. We, we are very privileged to get to, to talk to people like Amber and Josh. And I, you make a great point that, uh, we can always be learning from different people's experiences, but, you know, people are often too quick to just apply everything some person is doing, um, without thinking about their own context and kind of ab applying it to, to how it might fit them. Um, and, yeah, and it's like, well, this works right now for me. So therefore it's the ultimate thing for everybody all the time. No. And I'm going to interpret all my past history through this lens. I learned long ago as a kid that you got to, you got to kind of be a little bit more humble than that. And the crazy thing about diet and sharing information about diet is it, it's so easy for people to get very dogmatic about it and get very entrenched in, uh, you know, sometimes it's just about trying to justify you know, somebody, you know, why you think you're so special in a niche? I mean, it could come from insecurity and stuff like that. I, we see a lot of that in the comment sections online. People are always picking everyone apart and trying to say, oh, you did it wrong in the vegan world. You know, all these vegans are eating each other alive, telling each other you're doing the diet wrong. And they'll preemptively attack each other for doing the diet wrong before they even quit the diet just to discredit them. So it's I, I don't want to see the carnivore community doing that. I like to see all these different minds come together and experiment with this and learn what is right for us in our own individual context, which we've all got a lot of similarities, some differences, uh, but maybe not as many differences as we think. I think we all, we all need animal foods. And us in the carnivore community, we've realized that you need an abundance of animal foods yeah. to thrive. And maybe not everybody needs to go as far as we do, 
but including more meat, the diet, and less grains, less processed junk food, it's almost always going to result in better health outcomes, better psychological health, better physical health, and you know, very often uh, increased fertility and other benefits that go far beyond just uh, you know the little nagging, nagging pains and digestion that people are usually dealing with. So I think uh, it's really a privilege, man. So that, that, yeah. thanks for what you do, for sharing all the information. Absolutely. And Tristan, I'm sure folks are wondering, um, and, and you do some great vlogs on this too, but what does kind of um, a carnivore day of eating look like for you? All right. So I like to do a variety of different cuts of meat, uh, but it's always going to be red meat. Right. It's always going to be beef. So primarily beef based ruminant animals. I, I really like ribeyes, really like T bones, porterhouse steaks. I'll usually now. All right. So it depends on the context, right? So right now I'm gaining some weight. Right now I'm putting weight on. So I'll tell you what I'm doing right now at the end, but my typical diet will be a ribeye steak or a T-bone steak in the morning with a side of some suet, maybe sheep suet, maybe beef suet, or maybe bone marrow, something to get the fat content up. Uh, so if I have bone marrow, I might have some one-inch cuts of the bone from the lower leg, uh, and I'll pop the marrow out, and I'll eat that raw on the side. I'll sprinkle some uh, salt on top of that. I might have some high liver at the beginning of the meal, so basically uh, rotten fermented liver is where you take – liver, chop it up, put it in a jar, let it sit for like three months in a refrigerator. And uh, yeah, I really like high liver at the beginning of a meal. I find that it's like a really good digestive tonic. So I will have a bite of high liver, have a steak. That steak might be everywhere from 500 to 700 grams, depending if I'm trying to maintain weight or gain weight. If I was going to lose weight, I might add a little bit less fat, so a little bit less suet or bone marrow. Uh, and then I'll sometimes have a big glob of butter with that, like raw grass-fed butter on the side with a little bit of salt, and that's it. So it's basically pull the, fri pull the steak out of the fridge, uh, heat up a cast iron skillet really, really hot, put salt on both sides of it, get a nice brown crust on one side, flip it over, and basically sear it for 10 seconds on the other side, and it's still cold in the middle. So I like it really rare. I just find that it digests so well. It tastes so good. The texture is better. Um, yeah, over overcooked meat, I'm not the biggest fan of. So I, I like it pretty rare, pretty raw. Sometimes if I don't have time, I'll just eat the steak raw. But I do like that crust. I like how the salt kind of gets in there with the crust. That's really nice. So I get the best of both worlds. In the middle is cold. The outside is crust. Uh, second meal might be at the end of the day. That first meal being at like 8 o'clock in the morning. Second meal probably around 4, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Sometimes later. <laughs> And the second meal will be similar. It'll be a big piece of meat, whether that meat is uh, slow cooked from the slow cooker and some sort of animal fat source. Butter is seasonal here. So we live in Ecuador and sourcing good butter can be hard because I'm a, slob, a snob, not a slob. I'm a total food snob. And I, I don't know, I just, I, I'm really picky about my butter. I don't know. I really like good butter. I got this one source that gives me such amazing butter. So when I can get that butter, I'll make that a primary fat source along with suet, either from sheep or from beef. Both of those are great. And uh, bone marrow, sometimes brain, sometimes liver, sometimes cooked, sometimes raw. And I just kind of fluctuate throughout the week my intake of fat according to my goals and my uh, – my activity level. So if I'm on a higher activity day, I'm going to add more fat because it's more fat for fuel. And if I'm trying to cut body fat, I would be pulling back on the fat and eating a little bit less added fat. So it might look like close to two grams to one fat to protein, um, usually about 1.5 to two grams of fat per gram of protein and a little bit of high meat, a little bit of high liver in there. If I'm going to gain weight, what I'll do is I'll add raw whole milk and that might be i don't know one two sometimes three maybe even four liters of whole raw milk per day uh it can be really difficult to gain weight on a carnivorous diet it's very satiating and if you're in a ketotic state you're eating a ketogenic carnivorous diet it's very satiety inducing so um, i find that adding some carnivorous carbohydrate from whole raw milk 
is very suitable for me to gain weight and uh, my digestion's great when I do it. Whereas if I'm trying to gain weight and adding a lot of potatoes or starchy carbs or lots of, uh, I don't know, like bread, I just don't feel as good. So the anti-nutrient contents and all those foods are very high, whereas whole raw milk is full of live bacteria, protein, fat, carbohydrate, phosphorus, calcium, a lot of really, really important minerals and uh, fat-soluble vitamins. Basically, you can live off raw milk. So uh, that is my preferred way of gaining weight. So yeah, those are uh, several different pathways my day might take depending on the context. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I appreciate you explaining kind of the why behind you do certain things um, and the context in which you have certain goals you're trying to achieve. And um, on the milk, um, four liters a day is a lot. Um, but understand that's not every day. And, and especially it's only when you're trying to really gain. Um, do you adjust sort of your intake of other foods? Yeah. Um, you know, if you're say, having more milk. It, yes. Yes. If I'm going to have milk, it would be one meal with meat per day. So that meal would be like a 700 gram ribeye or T bone or porterhouse, something like that. Short ribs, maybe. And the rest of the day, I would just be drinking milk. So it'd be one mm. solid meal and then just sip it on the milk throughout the day. Versus so really the regular two meals. Exactly. And it simplifies yeah. it too. It actually makes it really easy because I'm not having to cook anything until yeah. end of the day when I have my steak. So it's not like intermittent fasting because I'm drinking milk throughout the day, but it does feel like that in certain regards. And I, I'm not a big fan. I wouldn't drink pasteurized milk. So that's just me. Uh, maybe do your own research. But uh, from my perspective, pasteurization of milk is criminal and it should be abolished. So I think yeah. raw milk is the way to go. Yeah, I think Weston Weston A. Price would probably agree with you there. Um, and I know electrolytes are a topic that are talked about a ton in the ketogenic community, particularly um, around keto gains. And I think they're really important. But uh, a lot of people experience when they've been carnivore, especially for a longer time, that they don't need to supplement with magnesium. They can put some salt on their food. They don't need to worry too much about potassium. Um, where do you stand on that currently for yourself and, and in general for people who have been doing carnivore longer? That's such a good question, man. Yeah, uh, it's great. You ask all the questions that, that I like to ask as well. So. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard a lot of different answers on this question, and it, it seems to me that survey says most people who've <laughs> done keto long term and then go carnivore, they end up never caring about their electrolytes again. Like they just, it's something of the past. Right. I can speculate on why that is and say, well, it could be because of the anti nutrient content of plants is decreasing the bioavailability of these minerals. So if you're having a lot of like spinach, if you're having a lot of kale, you're having a lot of high oxalate foods, which some, some types of kale are very high oxalate, others are pretty low, but those could be binding to calcium, causing a dis, um, kind of a, um, imbalance in our electrolytes and focusing on animal foods could give us more bioavailability in those electrolytes, especially when you're eating a lot of red meat. So I think a lot of us who've gone from keto to carnivore have had bottles of magnesium powder that just kind of go rancid in our kitchen after a few years <laughs> because it stops being relevant. Now, I do sometimes advise, especially if people have had kidney stones in the past and oxalate issues, what I've learned from a lot of these experts like Dr. Sal or she's not a doctor, technically Dr. Uh, um, Sally, Norton. Sally K. Norton, not Dr. Sally K. Norton, sorry. She has talked about the importance of calcium, of potassium and magnesium citrate, the citrate minerals being very beneficial for the removal of oxalate and for the lessening of symptoms as people are what she calls a dumping, the oxalates and uh, – yeah, so sometimes I have clients use that for a little bit, but I usually find that just salting your food when you're on carnivore tends to balance everything out. You know, and I've had blood tests that are carnivore and had perfectly fine electrolytes. And it's just, it's something that doesn't seem to matter as much. I, I wonder what the keto gains guys' opinion is on this whole carnivore thing. I haven't really talked to them in a while. They, they do some good work, but I think it's, uh, I think the carnivore stuff is pretty fascinating in the way that it changes everything. 
you know, from the electrolyte needs to uh, you know, sometimes even for people making it seem more important to get enough fat in. Whereas on a keto diet, mm. you've got Ted Damon kind of promoting like semi protein sparing modified fast type macros for fat loss where I've never really gone that far. But I have always told people that, you know, fat is something that you move around according to your goals. All right. Keto gains guys, uh, they say fat is a lever, right. which is, I guess, a decent analogy. Um, but I, I usually just say fat is what you move according to what you're trying to achieve. So if you're trying to lose body fat on a ketogenic diet, you don't need to be pounding cups and cups of butter. However, you know, talking to some people who've done a carnivore diet, some people do feel much better on more like two grams to one fat to protein ratio. So it's all going to be situational. Uh, you know, if you've got an autoimmune condition, uh, if you've got serious autoimmune issues, this could become more important. If you're a high level athlete, perhaps, uh, you know, more protein would be warranted. You see guys like Sean Baker. Yeah. He eats a little bit heavier on the protein end than some people, but. I think it's just the situational awareness that's so important. If you're like sweating a whole bunch, if you're doing a lot of saunas or something, you might want to increase your electrolyte intake. That that being said, I I do a steam room almost every single day. I do a sauna almost every day and don't supplement with electrolytes. However, at the time right now, I'm drinking milk, which has got the electrolytes in perfect balance and high abundance. So it's just – it really depends on the diet, depends on the person. And it depends on the context. So like ultra marathon runner, probably going to want some electrolytes. Uh, weekend warrior doing CrossFit one time a week, might not need to worry about it at all. Yeah, that's that's really important. And I love how you bring up how the context changes, um, switching to carnivore and, and based on what else you're doing in your life. Um, it's really important to remember and clear that you have a ton of experience from dealing with all the clients and people you've helped, um, along the way. Um, and Tristan, uh, one thing that, um, you know, I've seen your meals look amazing and some of the foods you're able to get down there in Ecuador, um, and the different cuts, the different bones, the things you and Jessica create. And I'm starting to learn how to create through, through the great carnivore cookbook. Um, you're so generous to share with me. Um, but I, I'm curious if you have started adding more collagen to your diet or gelatin, um, either in the form of kind of supplementing beef gelatin or, um, if that's just always been kind of a staple of yours through the organ meats you consume, bone broth, things like that. Yeah, great question. We we started making bone broth for our daughter uh, and us before we ever got into keto or carnivore. We were doing kind of you know Weston A. Price style paleo diet. It was high in fat, still had some carbs, wasn't concerned with ketosis, animal food heavy diet. We uh we did a lot of bone broth for like I don't know maybe three four years. I don't crave it anymore, to be honest. I, I love bone broth as an idea. I love it for other people. I see it doing a lot of good for a lot of people. Right. I just don't drink it anymore. And that's a, a thing I haven't really thought about making in a while. I don't know if I just saturated myself with it. I used to drink it every single day. And you know, if there were a cup of bone broth in front of me on a cold morning, I would do it. Like I would have some, but for the most part, our bone broth has been being consumed by our kids, our chickens, and our dogs. So <laughs> I've not been having it much. Now the the glycine, right? So you know the or I'm sorry, the uh, the collagen thing. So you have a lot yeah. of people talk about the methionine to glycine ratio. Uh, this is not something I'm concerned with at all. Um, you know, I've done a very collagen heavy diet. We was doing a lot of bone broth in my own. Personal N of one, it doesn't matter that much. I think a ribeye has so much freaking collagen in it. Like if you're cutting through that, those fatty ribbons and you put that in your mouth and those little chewy parts in there, it's just the whole steak is ribboned with collagen. And if you're peeling it off the bone at the end, like I do, you're getting a lot of collagen. So it's not something I'm too worried about. Uh, I don't think we need like to add bone meal or anything like that. Uh, it's not something I'm concerned with. But hey, if people want to do it, if people really like collagen, and they feel better if they supplement with collagen, that's great. Like if you have a major hip injury or a major spinal injury and you're trying to recover from it, by all means, 
go for the collagen. You know, it may be, maybe I'll experiment with it a little bit later this month, increasing my collagen intake and see if it uh, doesn't help my body out uh, in surprising ways that I haven't considered. But, you know, for me, I, I just haven't been messing with it much the last couple of years. Early on, I thought it was really important. And I've, uh, I don't know, I've just since, I guess I've kind of lost interest in, in collagen in general. I just focus on, I focus on eating nose to tail. Like I focus on the meat. I focus on the fat. And for me, that's enough. I don't need to worry so much about amino acid ratios. I don't really concern myself so much with uh, counting macros anymore because my habits are so refined that my natural habits, um, I'm so consistent, right? So I don't need to count macros because I did it for years and I just eat the same foods. So I don't, if I modify something, I will, uh, I will sometimes adjust carefully, right? So if I'm going to increase my carbohydrate in intake through milk, then I'll make sure to decrease my fat intake so I don't get, you know, too fat. <laughs> I don't get yeah. insulin resistant too quickly. So it's just, uh, it's about balance for me. And maybe I, I did plenty of collagen in the beginning of my experimentation and I just don't crave it anymore. Or maybe we don't need it. But I respect people who are, who are uh, talking about the importance of it. I know there's a lot of clinical research supporting collagen supplementation as well as just eating collagen-rich foods. I think a lot of ex-vegans probably do really well with you know, taking something like a Great Lakes uh, collagen or some of these collagen peptide products. I think they're great. I just prefer to get my stuff from Whole Foods. If I want more collagen, I'll get it from the bone broth, but I just don't crave the broth right now. So yeah, long story yeah. long. That's no, no, that's really helpful detail, and I think it makes a ton of sense, which is just there's there's a ton of collagen in steaks. Maybe Maybe some people need to worry about it. I've heard about people anecdotally feeling a lot better, especially people with kind of certain joint issues, gum issues, when they start to increase their glycine. But, you know, for the most part, if you're eating muscle meat um, and sometimes getting organs as well, you're, I think you're getting a ton of glycine, but we just don't know. We just don't know. What about, what do you think about this thing? Uh, so uh, Sally Norton, Sally K. Norton. I almost, I always almost say Dr. Sally K. Norton. We need to just <laughs> somebody honorary degree her on that lady <laughs> because she is so clever. Um, not that only doctors can be clever too, guys. There's loads of people. Amber O'Hearn, she's not a doctor and, uh, she could go toe to toe with, with most of these docs, uh, out there. Yeah. But she talked about oxalate being made from glycine within the body. Did you, did you talk to her about that yet? Oh, that's super interesting. No, I haven't. Um, that's really interesting. And I've also seen, I'd love to learn more about that. I've also seen um, biohacking chick Sylvia Tabor talk about how glycine overconsumption of glycine could possibly lead to a vitamin B6 deficiency, um, yeah, which I don't know a whole lot about. Yeah, so I think that could – I, I want to hear those perspectives. I'm not sold on the ideas, but yeah. I think it's something y'all need to consider, the possibility of this. I think the mechanistic data is really cool, and I think looking yeah. at the mechanisms is so important, especially because we're never going to see you know, uh, double-blind controlled studies on a carnivore diet with glycine supplementation, with collagen supplementation versus carnivore diet without – supplementation of glycine. I don't think we're ever going to see any carnivore diet research uh, in the mainstream at all. I think it's going to come down to everybody sharing their own data with each other, which is scientific, right? Your own N equals one is still scientific. This is not just pure anecdote. When you've got thousands and thousands of anecdotes, that adds up to a lot of useful data. Right. And uh, yeah, so I, I love all these different perspectives. So I, I'm not saying that glycine is going to mess up uh, your... Uh, body due to it being converted into oxalate, but there are some people who've made a case that this could be an issue with some people. Yeah, yeah. I think either way, you just have to be cautious and not go too extreme with it. Um, and Tristan, one thing you've talked a lot about, and I've learned so much from you about, is fasting and circadian rhythms. Um, and I've talked about it a lot on the show, but can you just start with you know why skipping breakfast and defaulting into chugging coffee and waiting as long as you can to eat your first meal might not be a great idea 
Oh man, yeah, this is this is like low carb. This is low carb air numero uno, I think. (laughs) This is like the gateway to low carb, but I feel like it's such a stumbling block, right? So people hear about uh, intermittent fasting, bulletproof coffee, right? Like they read about it in Cosmo magazine or some shit, right? And uh, they they hear about you could put butter in your coffee and skip breakfast, and it's just amazing. Well. It's not always the best idea. So some people are doing black coffee, and that's uh, you know basically the same thing. You are when you wake up in the morning, the light hits your eye, and it goes through the retina, it goes into the brain, and it hits the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the master regulator of our circadian rhythm. And uh, our circadian rhythm is the way our body is yoked to the environment and synchronized to the light environment around us. So in the morning, the light hits our eyes, goes into the brain, tells us. Wake up, move. We increase our blood glucose. These stress hormones increase. We get cortisol rising. We get adrenaline starting to go up. These stress hormones, they feel great, right? These are actually totally addictive as yeah. well. You know, adrenaline, cortisol, uh, these are not negative things, but when they're out of balance, they can become a net negative when they're in the wrong quantity at the wrong time for the wrong duration. So in the morning, our cortisol goes up, blood sugar goes up, stress hormones rise, and then we keep fasting. They stay elevated. It might be one o'clock in the afternoon by the time we have our first meal. With all those stress hormones elevated, we're having hunger suppression. You feel kind of like a high, you feel really good, very productive, very high energy. Right, your body physiologically is kind of a little bit hungry. And then by the time you eat, your body's very hungry. And a lot of the time the satiety signaling just doesn't hit. So they've done studies where they did isocaloric, um, they tested isocaloric meaning the same amount of calories in both groups. They tested intermittent fasting where people were eating in the morning versus intermittent fasting where people were eating in the evening. And isocalorically, people who are eating in the morning experience better fat loss. All right now, this is due to yeah. the fluctuation of hormones in the body. Everybody in the low carb world talks about how it's not just calories. There's obviously another factor to it that affect how much calorie intake we're going to be seeking, how many calories we're going to be uh, desiring to eat, what we're going to be hungry for. And that's the hormones. The hormones in the body drive us uh, to be hungry, to be satiated. Uh, to you know, be lethargic or to have energy. So we've got to mind our circadian rhythm in order to optimize our hormonal state. And that includes everything from cortisol to testosterone. All right? So if we're not sleeping sufficiently, we're going to have poor testosterone production. And what's actually cool is they've done studies using red light and shining red light, certain frequencies of red light on the testicles increases testosterone production. So getting outside in natural sunlight, you don't have to rub your balls on the sun, but you can get outside and get some natural light during the day. Shoot, maybe, you know, lay out in a a swimsuit or something by the pool. Or if you've got some privacy, yeah, great. You hang out naked in the sun. But the more sun on your skin throughout the day is going to benefit you hormonally beyond just vitamin D, which vitamin D is also a hormone. And it's also a hormone that's intimately involved with the circadian rhythm meaning we're going to produce more vitamin D midday in the sun when the sunlight hits our skin, uh, turns sulfated cholesterol into vitamin D, cholecalciferol, which contains cholesterol. So the circadian rhythm is very important for hunger cycles, for inflammation, right? Like one night of missed sleep is going to create pre-diabetic blood glucose numbers in just a normal person. Say you get two hours of sleep, you're a healthy person, you're all jacked and fit. Well, you're still going to look pre-diabetic if you get blood work that day. It's going to look not so good. You're fasting blood glucose. Um, of course, you could transfer that into it. We all know that elevated blood sugar over a long period of time increases inflammation, increases advanced glycation end products in the body. So there's this cascade of events that are directly caused by a disrupted circadian rhythm that can make it difficult to lose fat. It can make it difficult to produce testosterone, can make us feel and appear sick and sickly. You know, we all we all see it as a sign of health and vitality to see a tan, right? Like when somebody's got a suntan, you're like, oh, wow, you, your skin looks great. You look healthy. When somebody's really pale, th- they look sickly. 
Right. Also, when people have fake tan, they look kind of weird as well. They get all orange and like uba loopa ish. But you know, it's like you, the natural skin tone is something that indicates to us health, vitality, and fertility. So these are all intimately connected with our circadian rhythm, with sun exposure, and uh, you know, too much of the wrong type of light at the wrong time can be detrimental. So I'm a big fan of like red light therapy. Um, I like to use our Juve which is a uh, just a big LED panel, very powerful red and near-infrared lights that can improve the circadian rhythm through uh, – you can improve your circadian rhythm through exposure to this by increasing melatonin production at night. So avoiding artificial light at night or using like fire light or something like a red light therapy device to help with melatonin production and getting exposed to as much natural light during the day – Super important for hunger, sleep, hormone production, and intermittent fasting, fasting too long in the wrong scenarios. Like if you're a woman who's got thyroid issues, uh, if you're a night shift worker who's got chronic inflammation and insomnia, intermittent fasting in certain situations, you, you could be shooting yourself in the foot. So again, it's just it all comes down to the context. It comes down to the own your own individual context and what is optimal for me might not be optimal for a security guard working night shifts five days a week who is uh, you know under a high level of stress just due to the uh, physiological response to a disruptive circadian rhythm and uh, meal timing, meal frequency should take into account optimizing sleep patterns and optimizing hormone function, especially if you've got thyroid issues, testosterone issues, um, and, and sleep issues. Yeah, absolutely. I think circadian rhythm is so well overlooked and so critical um, and can often be even more important than diet, although they're all interlinked um, as you talk about. And Tristan, um, on the point of in training your circadian rhythm and um, just improving your life in general, one thing we haven't talked about is exercise. Uh, so curious to hear kind of how you structure your workouts, what your current workouts look like when you're trying to trying to gain muscle um, and how you think about that. Hello, Tristan. Oh, sorry. My, I had my microphone muted for a second. Oh, no there. worries. I forgot to unmute it. There's chickens in the background and stuff. So. <laughs> Yeah, the ambient noise away. So, yeah, uh, that's something that – it's a great question. It's something that is always changing and that I'm always kind of fluctuating. But right now, as I'm gaining some weight, exercise in the state of, uh, of diet that I'm doing now, which is increased carbohydrate intake from whole raw milk. So I'm on an all-animal foods diet. I'm on a carnivorous diet that includes carnivore carbs, raw milk. And uh, my workouts basically look like every single day – for the last 24 days, I've been doing 300 push-ups. So I've been kind of uh, – I was influenced by by Sean Baker to try out the uh, 30 days of 300 push-ups a day challenge. And as far as upper body, that's enough for my upper body for me, right? Like I'll do some rows with resistance bands. Uh, I'll do some jump squats with kettlebells. I'll do a little bit of you know arm workout every once in a while. But for upper body – the uh, that that's pretty much all I need right now is those 300 push-ups a day. And of course, this is not something I recommend for everybody. If it was not 300 push-ups a day, which is just an experiment I'm doing for fun, you know, Sean Baker's 52 years old. I'm 32 years old. If that guy can do it, I've got to be able to do it. And uh, so, um, <laughs> yeah, no, Sean Baker's a beast. So yeah, shout out to Sean. Um, if I wasn't doing that, I might be doing like. Uh, probably two lower body workouts a week and two upper body workouts a week or three full body workouts like every other day with one rest day in between, uh, bringing myself to near failure on a few reps and then bringing myself to failure on one set. Um, so a few sets near failure, one set going to failure, uh, going relatively heavy but kind of fluctuating and undulating the uh, the load uh, more frequency, uh, more intensity, those are always helpful for me to gain muscle. So if I'm trying to build a little bit more muscle, I might increase the frequency of workouts. Also, that would make me need to increase meal frequency uh, because the 
not only the you know caloric necessities of intense workouts, but also you need to be in an excess of food intake in order to gain weight, right? Like you actually do need to increase calories to gain right. weight. Uh, the, the whole calories don't matter thing is it's, it doesn't really pan out that way. You know, calories do matter. If you say calories don't matter, you're saying the amount of food you eat doesn't matter. And if you're trying to gain weight, you got to eat a bunch of food. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, heavy, uh, heavy lifting, kettlebells, calisthenics. I like to play with my dogs. Um, I got a puppy right now. He's almost a year old and he's like 65 pounds. I think right now, maybe he's more, maybe he's 70. Oh, nice. He's, uh, yeah, he's fun. He likes to tug. He, any single, any moment of the day, he's down to throw the ball. He's down to run around. He's down to wrestle. And uh, so, yeah, I like to play with the dogs, run around with the kids, throw the kids around. Um, yeah, just basic stuff, you know, kettlebells. And then the basic big three powerlifting movements always been go-tos, deadlifting, squatting, bench pressing, uh, pull-ups, chin-ups, weighted chins, stuff like that. That's what it looks like. And sometimes some intense uh, hill sprints. So I'll go on a hike every now and then and I'll go, um, you know, I'll sprint up the hill. Maybe yeah, like 30 second sprint, three minute walking, 30 second sprint. Yeah, that's great. Sounds like a really kind of intuitive approach, but also you've been doing this stuff for so long that you can really, uh, you can do that based on your knowledge base. Um, right. Yeah. If it was somebody else, like if I was a newbie, uh, it would, it would be different. Right. So if somebody's starting out, sometimes it's good to just get on like a basic five by five and get them to increase their strength. Right. It's like, Hey, you know, build your strength in the bench press, deadlift and squat. And those three movements are enough. That's a simple approach, right? You, some people like bodybuilding stuff. Some people, uh, they have joint issues, so they want to be more careful with heavy lifting. So it's just, it, it kind of depends on the context. I really like kettlebells too, just because they're so fun and dynamic. Uh, and then, of course, like other movements, you know, even without weights, you know, just normal movement, like running around. Um, uh, if you like to dance, you know, whatever it is. Some people are really into like yoga, stuff like that, stretching. Um, but just basic movement is important throughout the day. A lot of us are sedentary, working on computers. So, like, you know, five minutes of walking around a building could change somebody's life if they do that two to three times a day during their working hours, take a 10 minute break, walk around the building. Um, they can find that they just feel better and they're more productive and they lose more weight just with that. It's all about the, uh, I guess that's the theme today. <laughs> it's all about context. Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge fan of, of just getting a good amount of walking in improves your mood so much too. Um, and Tristan, this has been super awesome. I'm sure folks, um, if they have heard of you, really enjoyed you speaking. If they haven't heard of you, want to find out more about the stuff you're doing. So where can they find out more and kind of what's what's next um, for you and, and Primal Edge Health? Awesome, man. Well, thanks a lot. You mentioned uh, you mentioned our book, The Carnivore Cookbook, uh, for P zero carb recipes for people who really love animals. So that one's available <laughs> on our website. You can get that from PrimalEdgeHealth.com. And yeah, we're, we're going through a major overhaul of the website right now, trying to get that all dialed in and starting to put out more content via the website. We've got a podcast. Uh, I do a lot of videos and live streams on YouTube. Uh, I usually do at least uh, two to three live streams per week, sometimes up to like five. So yeah, check out and subscribe to Primal Edge Health on YouTube. You can find us there. Uh, every single month we do our Keto and Carnivore Collective, our group coaching. I do private consultations too, but I kind of like going towards the group coaching model because it allows me to handle the amount of client requests I get per month. And they also get to, uh, get to do this in a group setting. So not only do you have your coaches, you have this group community aspect to the coaching that makes it really fun and enjoyable. So we do that. We do two live interactive voice chats every single week in the Keto and Carnivore Collective. We're starting our next one. We usually start at the beginning of the month. I don't know when this will be uh, published, so I won't say when we're starting the next one. But uh, beginning of every month, we do the Keto and Carnivore Collective. We are moving towards having a few other cool things to offer really soon. Uh, like we've got a free, what is it? A uh, Keto Carnivore, uh, I'm sorry, a Carnivore Diet shopping and re shopping list and resources. That's a free download. It's available on our website right now. And um, yeah, I highly encourage people to check out the, the book, Jessica. 
uh, did a really good job with the carnivore cookbook. It's a great introduction to reintroduction to animal foods. And it takes a diet. It takes an approach that a lot of other you know, diets and nutrition books have never taken. And it's all animal foods. There's no plants in this book. There's some recommendations sometimes on how to use spices. And if you want to add some spices, you can. But we wanted to make this book for like the roots carnivores. We wanted to make this book for people who are doing it as an elimination diet, who are, you know, the uh, the real carnivores out there. And we decided to keep only animal foods in the book. So it's a pretty fun one. It's a really beautiful book. Jessica did a great job with it. And you can get that on our website, Privilege Health. It's available in print and as an ebook. Um, and that's, yeah, that's about it, man. Check check us out on YouTube. That's where you're going to find the most output of content as well as Instagram. Yeah. And I'll definitely link to all those in the show notes, um, carnivorecast.com slash podcast slash Tristan. Um, and I'll just put in another plug for the cookbook. I, it's absolutely beautiful. You guys did a really fantastic job with that. And you might think, oh, carnivore, how complicated can it be? But there's a lot of unique recipes, ways to cook organ meats, uh, special seafood dishes, uh, quiches with, with eggs and organ meats and bacon and cheese and, and cool bone broth recipes, all kinds of great stuff in there. So really highly yeah, we recommend wanted that. To be no, we wanted to do a nose to tail book, which we've always you know, yep. kind of focused on the nose to tail approach. So we show you how to use the whole animal. Uh, we even show you how to use testicles if you want to get crazy with it. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, tongue, um, you know, how to make, yeah, even teach you how to make high liver in the book, which is a, uh, something I really have been stoked on lately. I'm a really big fan of the high meats. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty unique book. Nose to tail eating. There's a whole section on organs. Uh, there's a section of sauces and fats. And the, it's essentially kind of a training manual of how to use the whole animal and how to use only animal foods in the kitchen. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks again for your time today, Tristan. Really appreciate it. This has been super fun for me, and I'm sure folks will love this. Scott, it's an honor. Thanks for having me on, man. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, keep keep it up, man. The Carnivore Cast is awesome. Look, you look too. To keep up all the great work. Right. Thanks. Bye. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered, or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.